So today is an awesome lecture. I love development. It's awesome. If I was not studying, what, well, I still, I pretty much do study development, but in a roundabout way. If I was not doing what I would be doing, I would also be studying development because it's awesome. Um, so why study embryology or development? And the reason is, the reason you guys need to know this, at least for one animal, is because um, when you make transgenic plants or insects or animals, um, you have to know about their fertilization process. You have to know about how the egg forms and you have to know how the organs form. You have to know all that stuff. Because if you want to change that stuff, uh, you have to do it in the egg or the embryo. So it's really helpful to have a, uh, at least a basic understanding of development. And, and the basic sort of big concepts that you have to deal with. And once you know, so we're gonna talk about insect development. And you might think, well, why, why would I bother learning about insects? Um, insects are the most basic uh, multicellular animals. I mean, I guess they're not the most basic, but they are a basic system. We know a lot about Drosophila. And if you understand Drosophila development, you get the basic gist of more complex animal development. So it's a very simple system in which you can, once you have a grasp of that, it, it's gonna help your understanding of everything else. So just quick, some terms, and I know you guys know these because we've talked about it before, but you have to know the difference between somatic and germline. And somatic are cells that form the body. They're, they never get passed on to the next generation. And then germline is a very specific subset of cells that form the testes and the ovaries. And even not all testes cells are germline cells, okay? There's a very specific, there's cells that form the testes like body. So if like, these are what mosquito testes look like. There's cells that form like the body of the testes. Those are somatic, okay? And then there's specifically little cells in here called the stem cell niche. These are the germline cells. So it's a very small subset of cells that are germline cells. And these are the cells that as they replicate, as they go through development, they form sperm in the testes. So those are the germline cells. Germline cells form sperm or eggs in the ovaries, okay? So you need to know the difference between somatic and germline. Um, the other, another big term that comes up a lot in development is this term called morphogens, morphogens. So when you start development, you start from an egg and a sperm, okay? And this thing progressively gets more complicated through divisions and specification of different cell types. And there are all kinds of chemicals or proteins or hormones throughout development that tell certain cells in certain regions to become a certain type. So you know that when you first start off, you start off as kind of like a stem cell. So like the eggs and the germ and the testes, when they combine, they form a stem cell. And that, that egg or that zygote, that stem cell, can form every single different type of cell in the body. So if you're talking about insects, it could be, they could form like the gut cells. It could form like the testes cells. It could form like the brain cells. But all those cells are different, right? And you can't take a brain cell and change it into a testes cell. I mean, you can kind of, but you have to revert it to a stem cell and then have it go through to the development. So basically the process of development is a process of continual specification of cell types of which there's no going back. And morphogens are these chemicals or proteins or signals that tell a certain cell to change to a more specified cell type with no going back, okay? So a lot of development is a study of these morphogenic effectors, these morphogens, and figuring out the real causal signal that tells certain cells to develop a certain way. Um, okay, the other final just basic concept of development, which is why insects are so good, is insects are by definition uh, segmented organisms, okay? And if you look at, I mean, we have, they have this in common with worms and nematodes and actually all, all animals, if you look at their development, their development is basically a procession of developing segments. And then you tell different segments 
to become different things. So insects are kind of a great way to look at this because insects, by definition, they have head, thorax, abdomen. So this is a segment, this is a segment, this is a segment. And even within these segments, there's actually segments in the head that have different mouth parts. There's segments in the thorax that have different legs or wings. There's segments in the abdomen, which have different plates. So development really proceeds in most organisms, maybe not in plants, but in animals through building progressive segments, segmentations, and then telling different things, different segments to do different things, okay? And that's how you get maybe like eyes as this segment has a specific morphogen that tells this segment to make an eye. So that's kind of a basic conceptual thing of development. Let me see, I, I like to show people this video because Awesome. Let's see if I can do this. Oh my god. Every time I do this, it messes stuff up. I'll just go, I'll just refine it. If you go to so this is a video of Drosophila embryo. development. This is an awesome video. So this is Drosophila development sped up in one minute. So here you're looking at, they've stained the nuclei. Um, so it's, it hasn't, it didn't start at the first division because um, there's all these nuclei. So it's, it's starting after fertilization. But what you're seeing here is um, on, you're seeing basically a surface layer of what's called the blastoderm, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, and then this this will show you how things develop. So there's an awesome quote from Richard Dawkins, um, who says that basically all animal development is basically like 3D origami. So it's basically, you get these planes, these 3D planes of cells, and development happens by these things folding and invaginating in on themselves and creating a bunch of different like tubular structures. So what you just saw, that invagination, that's called gastrulation, that right there, that's called gastrulation. That happens in all animals that develop, where you, first the embryo starts as just this layer of cells on the outside. And then to start building three dimensionality, you get this invagination to start making tubular structures. So that's gastrulation right there. We'll talk more about that. And then once things have invaginated, you start to get different layers of cells. So like mesoderm, endoderm, ectoderm. Ectoderm is like cells on the outside that form your skin. Endoderm cells form like your organs and stuff like that. The mesoderm is like in the middle. So now you see the segmentations. Do you see how you're starting to see the segments, right? You see that? So the embryo has been told to make segments. Here's the head up here. And there's been morphogens that you didn't see but I'll rewind. You can even see the segments here. Let's see where we get to the point where we can see segmentation. Right now, you're starting to see the segments. And this is the abdomen right here, so it's kind of wound around itself. Um, but you have these different segments developing. Okay. And then eventually, this is the yolk right here, so this is being eaten by these cells. And now it's going to fold up and now you're gonna get what's called dorsal closure where these cells will combine with these cells and all this egg yolk will then be finally gone and it will be a complete organism. So here's dorsal closure coming. See how it's, it's reaching to seal all these tubes. So the ectoderm is now sealing itself around the internal structures. And you'll get this sealing here. And now it's completely sealed. And now there's a bunch of tubes inside and now you're gonna, it's gonna start forming into a finalized larvae. And then it will start crawling. I don't know why it's like fidgeting like that. It might actually be moving. So that's that. So it's an awesome video. Watch, there's a bunch of these, watch them. You can find sweet videos like that. Um, okay, so back to the lecture. 
Okay, so let's start with the ovaries because the eggs come from the ovaries. So, okay. The ovaries job is to make eggs. Uh, and basically that job encompasses providing all kinds of nutrition for that egg to develop. So when you think about development of a new organism, insects will lay their eggs outside and those eggs can't go collect food, right? So that egg needs to be given enough nutrients to be able to completely develop into a whole new organism that then can leave the egg and get its own food as a larva. So the job of the ovaries is to make nutrition for the eggs and package the eggs with enough nutrition to develop. That's literally the job of the ovaries, okay? So um, the way that that happens is all, all organisms that fertilize and make eggs have this process called vitello, let me spell this wrong, vitellogenesis, okay? So vitellogenesis means something specific in development and in biology. Vitellogenesis is the production of vitellogenin, which is a protein, which is also called the yolk protein, okay? So in like a chicken egg, chicken egg, the yolk uh, has the chicken vitellogenin in it. It's a protein, the definition, the, the use of the yolk protein is literally just a stockpile, stockpile of protein, and there's also fats in there, but it's mainly a bunch of stockpiled protein that the egg then, as it develops, it eats the yolk, eats the yolk. So it will take that vitellogenin protein and through catabolism, will break down those peptides and use the energy stored in those peptides for energy. That's why when you eat chicken eggs or insect eggs, if you do, you get a bunch of protein because they're stockpiled with protein to uh, provide energy for the development of those eggs. So that's what vitellogenin is. And then the yolk protein, you find the yolk protein in all kinds of insects and all kinds of animals. So um, chickens make yolk protein, Drosophila make yolk protein and uh, mosquitoes make yolk protein. And it's all sort of, there's all sort of orthologs or homologs of this protein called vitellogenin. So the way that it works, how does it work? Is oh, let's just do a mosquito, for example. So insects have an organ, is, an organ called the fat body, fat body, which stores energy and fats. And when a mosquito, takes a blood meal, she, her gut gets filled with blood, and then the gut has stretch receptors, stretch receptors which stretch out as the gut stretches. The stretch receptors then send a signal to the fat body that tells the fat body, um, I took a blood meal, make eggs, okay? So then the fat body makes vitellogenin, vitellogenin, and secretes vitellogenin into the hemolymph. The hemolymph is like the greenish blood of the insect. So it's, we'll, the fat body will secrete the vitellogenin into the hemolymph, which will circulate around. And then the female has ovaries, which pick up, uptake, through receptor-mediated endocytosis, that vitellogenin, take it into the ovaries, and then stockpile it in the eggs. So the ovaries don't actually make the vitellogenin in some cases. A lot of times a different organ, organ makes the vitellogenin, secretes it, and then the ovaries' job is to take it up and deposit it into the eggs. So this process, this whole process is called vitellogenesis, okay? So we've started with the female taking a blood meal, or in this case, if it's Drosophila, the female, maybe she found a good stockpile of yeast and ate it, and then the vitellogenesis process started. Um, okay, I talked about the germ stem cell niche. So then what happens is in the ovaries, so ovaries also kind of look like this, and you get a basically a linear progression, progression of development from the stem cell niche 
to the end of the ovary, uh, which at the end of the ovary are mature eggs, which then go out a tube and get deposited by the female in oviposition, oviposition, okay? So as these eggs develop, you get a series of mitotic, mitotic divisions from the stem cells, okay? And these things are linked. Their cytoplasm is linked. So their cytoplasm is basically shared. And you get these divisions, progressive divisions, where each time you double the amount of cells that are all linked by these ring canals that originate from the stem cells. These are germline cells. And then eventually, as you progress to the end, you get what's called an ovarial. And in the ovarial, is one cell that's an egg, and you have seven other cells that are called nurse cells. And then these are surrounded by little somatic cells called follicle cells. Okay, now the role Am I on this yet? Yes, I am. Okay, so let's talk about the difference between the egg, the nurse cells, and the follicle cells and what they do. So the egg and the nurse cells, the egg and the nurse cells are both derived from the germline. So these are derived from the stem cells, okay? The follicle cells are somatic. They are derived from the ovary tissue cells. They're not going to get passed on. The only cell that's actually going to get passed on is this egg. Okay. So the role of the follicle cells is to protect the egg and give it and the nurse cells what they need. Okay. So that means like give them, get them the vitelgenin, get them, get them the stuff, get them what they need. The role of the nurse cells is to stockpile the vitelligenin, but also morphogens. So what you see happening here in development is the egg, the programming of the egg, the development, The programming of that cell, the programming, the process, the actual program that tells it how to develop is already being programmed in the ovaries by the nurse cells. So the nurse cells are synthesizing morphogens, and in this case, it's mostly messenger RNA. So they're synthesizing very, very specific messenger RNAs that are very, very important in early development, and they are depositing those RNAs into the egg, okay? And each of these morphogenic RNAs has a certain localization. So you might have certain RNAs that get localized right here. And that sort of defines the posterior end of the egg. And you might get other morphogens that localize right here. And that sort of defines the anterior end of the egg. So basically what's happening is the role of the nurse cells is to start programming the, what would you call it? The polarity of the cell. And you're, by definition, you're defining which part of the egg is going to be the posterior end, which part of the egg is gonna be the head or the anterior end, and which part of the egg is gonna be in the middle. Does that make sense? So the nurse cells, their whole job is to synthesize and stockpile all these RNAs for the egg. And let me just emphasize that as the egg is laid, so in oviposition of the female, as the egg is coming out, the female has a little organ called the spermatheca, which stores sperm from a mating. And as she oviposits the egg, she will give it a sperm and fertilize it as she's laying it, okay? But then, after that fertilized egg is laid and it starts development, there is no transcription. The egg does not want to waste its energy 
transcribing its own genes, okay? It needs to spend all that energy getting to a point where it can survive. So it's only using, only using messenger RNA that was deposited from the nurse cells for like the first 15 divisions. It's like the first two hours of development, okay? It's straight up just using messenger RNA from the nurse cells that was already deposited in the egg. So there's a special name for these genes that are deposited from the mother, from the nurse cells. And the name of these genes is called maternal effect genes. So these are morphogens that are given to the egg, the new embryo, from the mother, okay? And these can, this is how, if you hear nowadays, sometimes there's a lot of, there's a lot of interest in these. In like humans, you can hear about genetic effects that the genotype of the individual doesn't actually have a particular gene, but because his mom had a gene, uh, the embryo develops a certain way. So that would be a maternal effect gene. And that would be one of these morphogens that as that egg was fertilized, didn't matter what the genotype of the egg was, all that mattered was this messenger RNA that was sitting in the egg from the mom. Does that make sense? So in that way, the genotype of the mom can affect the embryo, even if the embryo doesn't share that same genotype, if that makes sense. Okay, so you wanna know maternal effect genes. And the basic, the basic role of the maternal effect genes is to tell what in the egg is the butt end and what in the egg is the head end, okay? So you've already started in the ovary defining segments. You're defining left and right, anterior, posterior, butt and head. So let's look at butt head. <laughs> uh, okay. So let me just show you a picture of what, what one of these things would look like and how we know this. So look at this. This is an expression pattern of Nanos messenger RNA. So Nanos is a very famous maternal effect gene. And here's the egg, okay? And you can see where they've done, they must have done like, um, this must be fish, fluorescent in situ hybridization of Nanos messenger RNA. And look where you see it, you see it right there. So that's saying P, that's saying, this part of the egg is posterior. And then, since that messenger RNA is there, the ribosomes of the egg can just translate that. There's no need for transcription. Transcription doesn't even have to happen because the RNA has already been stockpiled. So the protein can get translated, or the RNA can get translated into protein, into nanos protein. And then you get this diffusive curve of nanos concentration, which defines the posterior end of the egg. Okay? So why does it force the RNA to, to get there? To stay in yeah, that's a very, very good question. So uh awesome question. Um, let me explain that. So when you make messenger RNA, you have an ORF. I love this question. You have a five prime end and a three prime end. And you have a promoter, okay? And when this messenger RNA gets made, oftentimes transcription, transcription might start wherever the promoter is. It might start before the start codon, okay? So if you get transcription, you might get transcription of a gene that looks like this. Here's a messenger RNA. And the only coding part is here to here, okay? And this is what we call five prime UTR, and this is what we call three prime UTR. This stands for untranslated region, okay? So the only thing that's gonna get translated into protein is this part, because the ribosome will see the start codon and the stop codon. But these pieces of the transcript, and you also have the poly A tail and eukaryotes, these pieces of the transcript can be very, very important for localization of that transcript. So in the nurse cells, the nurse cells will make proteins 
which are RNA binding proteins. And their sole function is to localize maternal effect transcripts. So a mom will not only stockpile these RNAs, she will make protein X. And the role of protein X is to grab either the three prime or the five prime UTR. It'll grab it, it'll bind it, stabilize that transcript. And then there are cytoskeletal elements so if you know about, we talked about this eukaryotes versus prokaryotes. Eukaryotes have cytoskeleton, which is like microtubules, actin, okay? And if you look at the ovaries, as the nurse cells, nurse cells, egg, they're all connected by these things called ring canals. And in the ring canals are strings of microtubules. And there are what are called motor proteins. You might have heard about these if you've learned in muscle. Have you guys learned about muscle physiology? There's a special protein called myosin um, and what's the other one? There's another one. But myosin's job is to grab microtubules and contract them. And what? I think myosin grabs microtubules, but there's another one that grabs actin. Actin is another component of the cytoskeleton. But there's basically things that are called motor proteins. One of them is called dynein. And these things are little, little walking machines. They actually have legs and they walk, like they move their legs based on ATP along microtubules. So what happens with these RNAs is they get synthesized in the nurse cells. And then there's an RNA binding protein that grabs it. And then that RNA binding protein couples with a motor protein. And then the motor protein literally like walks it to the spot it needs to go. Yes, the, the, it's, uh, the myosin actin uh, complex in muscle, then it basically does the same thing, but it, instead of two legs, it's got one that kind of pulls back. Yeah. 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 And, and there's a, in, in one sense, if you have like free myosin, it can walk, but in muscles, it's fixed to something. So that's how you get like a contraction of the muscles. Um, so it's it's all that's why that's why it's it's that's why it's so funny that if you understand molecular biology of a cell, you can also understand like how organ organs work, like muscles work, because they're using the same protein components in just different configurations. So um, so that's how that answers your question of how the RNAs get to the spot where they need to go and how they stay there, because they're actually physically attached to things that walk them to the place they need to go. It's not just straight up passive diffusion. Um, and do those kind of remain there once they're at their destination? Yes. But once they get translated into protein, like look at the picture. Once they get translated into protein, there will be this diffusive um, diffusion of the protein, right? And that's part of what forms the gradient, is there are these thresholds where the different factors will turn on or off based on a certain threshold of concentration of a certain morphogen. And say, once you're past this threshold, certain genes are off. And once you're on this side of this threshold, certain genes are on. And that's what tells it posterior, anterior, if that makes sense. Okay, great question. So, <clears throat> okay, now let's talk about eggs. So now we're at the point where you understand ootogenesis how the eggs get made in the ovary and how the mom's maternal effect genes already program the egg for development. Now the egg gets laid, let's look at the egg. So the eggs have an egg shell. The outer hard egg shell is called the chorion. Okay, but there's more to egg shells than just the chorion. There's also uh, an inner wax layer, wax layer. What would, uh, why would they wanna put wax, waxy lipids? Yeah, it or keeps water in, so it's it definitely keep, it prevents it from drowning, but it also prevents it from desiccating. So that's a big concern with eggs is you have to have enough. It needs to sit somewhere for two hours, for however long development is, two days to, to develop into an organism. And if you put it in like like how do eggs in the desert like sit? in the sun for two days. I mean, they probably wouldn't be sitting in the sun. They'd probably get laid under a rock. But 
you get the point. Like you need to have a mechanism to prevent water from just straight up leaving because water is a valuable resource. So there's a wax layer that will prevent desiccation. Uh, and then there's also an inner membrane, a membrane of fatty tissue that surrounds it called the vitellin, vitellin membrane. So when you, I talked about last time about when you microinject eggs, sometimes in Drosophila, we will decorinate them. We'll treat them with bleach and the bleach will remove the outer layers. And what you're left with is an egg. And the only thing holding it, holding it together is a little balloon called the vitellin membrane. Is that the same thing like whenever you hard boil eggs and there's that layer of skin do you know, uh, did you know chicken biology? You're, uh, the, mm. I, my gut would be like, yeah, that makes sense. But I don't know because I'm not a chicken expert. Yeah, and it's actually interesting because it's a, although I really will say, um, is there a secondary one that surrounds the yolk generally? I don't know. Like the, the, what I'm, what I'm getting at is that there's multiple layers of okay. different things. And it might be, it might be that chickens have three or, or insects have one or, you know, like, but, I, but the point is that there's multiple layers. Some of these are wax, some of these are membranes, some of these are hard shells. Um, so I don't know specifically, but I would probably say, yeah, it's probably like an analogous uh, thing. We, we definitely have a structure we call the vitellin membrane, but it's around the yolk. And it's actually a really important measure of um, egg quality. Yeah. Um, Okay, the final thing about egg structure is most of these eggs will have a little hole. What do you think that would be for? Well, there are, in Drosophila, Drosophila has funny like antennae on the eggs, which are respiratory tubes. So Drosophila will lay their eggs like on the surface like this, they'll stick them in into either rotting fruit or whatever, and then they'll leave these little like antennae sticking out so that the eggs can breathe. But that's not what this little hole is. But yes, they, some eggs do have that. Some eggs look really crazy. Is that, it a way for the organism to break out of eggs? Like sometimes that will be programmed in insects. Some insect eggs will have a little like fissure here that allows that. But think about like if we completely seal off the embryo. I mean, they need like an extension hole to go in the no, it's for it's actually for the entrance of the sperm. So the sperm has to get in somehow. You can't make it completely like a sealed off thing, otherwise you can never fertilize it. So there's a little hole called the micropile. Micropile. And that's the hole that the sperm gets in. So it's funny because like in humans, there's always like uh I don't think we have eggs. We don't have eggshells. So the sperm, I guess you just always see these pictures where like sperm is like like getting in anywhere. It's not like that in insects. Uh, there's a very specific hole that the sperm goes through. Uh, it's called the micropile. Okay, and then I just finished with, yes, there are sometimes specialized, very specialized structures of the eggs that help their either development or help them survive in certain situations. And it's all related to a lot, oftentimes the biology of the egg. Like in fleas, fleas will lay their eggs, wait, not fleas, in body lice. So body lice, Body lice um, will make knits and they will cement their eggs onto your hairs, okay, or in your clothes. And then there's like a, there's like a crack and it's very, very difficult for the louse uh, to get out. So what the louse will do is it will suck up air here and then it will push the air out the back end to build up pressure back here until it pops off the cap, the cap will pop off, and then the body louse larvae will crawl out. <laughs> so some of these eggs are like really cool. Um, okay, now let's talk about the zygote. So the zygote is you've laid an egg, it's been fertilized, now you're ready to go. You're ready to combine, you're ready to start developing. Um, how much time do I have? Okay, I got, I got time. Okay, so in insects, this is different now. Here's where you start to see, you start to, there are some differences between insects and animals. Insects are very unique 
and that you have what's called uh, syncytia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it's a syncytium. It's basically one shared cytoplasm. So as the insect egg develops, you will get two pronuclei. So a nuclei that came from the mom, nuclei that came from the father. These will divide at least once, and then you get them to combine with each other. Okay, so then this makes a nuclei, this makes a nuclei, and then you start to really replicate, and each division you have double the amount of cells, right? So as that's happening, this is unique in that they're not, they're not cells. The definition of a cell is literally a closed compartment, okay? And insects, as they start to develop, they're just nuclei. And the nuclei sit around in the egg and just share the cytoplasm, okay? Now, this is not true for animals. So it's not, it's not always like that. It's, this is how it's true in insects, okay? So that's the syncytia, okay? And we already talked about the morphogens. So if this is the posterior end, there'll be certain transcripts that are making certain proteins that tell nuclei in this area to do certain things, turn certain genes on or off. Over here, turn certain genes on or off based on plus minus presence of certain morphogen. Is that called like the transcriptome? Transcriptome is all genes that are being actively transcribed. So actually the transcriptome of an early embryo would be zero. There'd be no, there'd be no transcript. Well, I mean, there's exceptions. There's some very, very early transcript. But transcriptome is basically, what are all the genes that are being transcribed right now at this point in time? Um, but you could, in, you could in some sense say like all the transcripts that are present sitting there would be, I guess, a part, like it'd be like an egg transcriptome. If that, does that make sense? Like there's subtle nuances in how when you say transcriptome, what that means. Um, but yeah, like if there were, if you just measured, like what are all the transcripts present in the egg, uh, that, that you could call that an egg transcriptome. But it would be nuanced because egg is not actually transcribing. Those are maternal effect transcripts. So that's how that that's how it would be nuanced. Um, okay, so there's a syncytia. All these nuclei are sitting in there sharing a cytoplasm. And then what happens? Okay, so then then there's a series. There's a series of named, specifically named morphogens. And I want you guys to know these names and know like what they do. And let's look at the, I have pictures for this. So let's look at this figure. So the first things that come first, which we already talked about are the maternal effect genes, okay? And then the maternal effect genes turn on or off based on the gradient gap genes. And they're called gap genes because they are expressed in patterned gaps. So like this one is on in the middle, but it, there's a gap here and there's a gap here. And there's other gap genes that are on on this end and this end, but not in the middle. So they make gaps, does that make sense? So it's again, it's a further progression of segmentation. So here you have a segment pattern of on the left is something, on the right is something. Then the gap genes turn on and you start to get more differentiation of these segments. So you get a left, a middle, and a right. Okay, then the gap genes on or off have consequences that turn on or off the pair rule genes. Okay, the pair rule genes is where you're really starting to get segments. Okay, so now we're actually defining here's head. The first three segments are thorax. These segments will be abdomen. We're actually starting to develop the segments based on the pair rule genes. Okay, then the pair rule genes on or off. These are all like transcription factors. Does that make sense? Like they're binding, turning on certain things. They're regulatory genes, okay? Oftentimes they're DNA binding proteins, turning things on or off. Then the pair rule genes turn on the segment polarity genes. Segment polarity genes are like, if you have segment A, telling it which segment, which part of that segment is the posterior part, 
and which part of that segment is the anterior part, okay? Because if you look at insect segments, the segment is, is, is not necessarily developed the same. Like it's different on this end than it is on this end. So the segment polarity genes create polarity left and right of each segment, okay? And then the segment polarity genes and all these other things have effects turning on or off the Hox genes, which we talked about. Hox genes are homeotic, homeotic genes. And these genes turn on in very specific segments to tell it to develop very specific structures like eye or wing or leg or mouth part. Okay, so Hox, gene, Hox genes are transcription factors that turn on those processes of development. So you can very clearly see that in Drosophila, really all you need to do is you, the whole development is based around developing patterns of segments. And when you look at the, how do we know this? So if you do, if you do, this is why this is just so cool. Like these are, this is just like the coolest experiments. These are, um, these are, you could do this in multiple ways. You could do this with a reporter. So one way you could do these experiments would be you take promoter and five prime uh, UTR, three prime UTR of gene X. And then in the middle, you delete gene X and you put a reporter like LAC-Z or GFP or something like that that you can see. And then what's going to happen is this gene is going to get turned on the same way as gene X. And it's going to localize the same way as gene X because it's got five prime UTR, three prime UTR. But instead of being gene X, it's going to be LAC-Z or GFP, which is going to be a reporter that you can measure. And you're going to be able to actually see like the localization pattern of this particular transcript or this particular protein. You could also do this with fish, like I said, where you're directly detecting where the presence of this transcript is, messenger RNA. Um, how else could you do this? You could also do this with immunofluorescence. So if you wanted to detect the protein, you could do this with antibodies and you could get data that looked like this. But basically, we have ways of detecting the expression patterns and detecting the localization of where these things occur. So we can actually like look and we can actually like see what I'm telling you happens right here. We can see this throughout development. And you can make different knockouts, you can make different mutations of the five prime UTR, three prime UTR, and see how the transcript then changes its localization. Okay, uh, here is expression just patterns, just an example of like gap genes. So these are our patterns mapped out of what the gap genes look like. Here is the fly I was telling you about. When you mutate that Hox gene, you can get uh, where the haltiers would be. You now have a four winged fly and the wings are perfectly fine. Like the wings look like great wings. I mean, they're not, they're not functional because the musculature is not is not properly developed. But um, like all you need to do is turn on one gene and you can create perfect wings on a weird segment. There's also fly mutants where you can you can turn on make one mutation and then a leg will grow where the eye should be. And so you can do all these like weird, crazy like mutations by by mutating these Hox genes. That's why another reason why development is just like so cool. Get these crazy phenotypes. Um, okay, we talked about cap genes, talked about the pair rule genes, segment polarity genes, Hox genes. Okay, now just to end, we need to talk about the blastoderm, blastoderm, and then gastrulation. So blastoderm formation, okay, is when you get when you finalize an outer layer of cells. So you can imagine at the first embryo, there might just be one nuclei. Then in the next division, there's two. Then in the next division, there's four. Then in the next division, there's eight. Then in the next division, 16, you get the point, okay? And at some point, at some point, you have so many nuclei that they are perfectly patterned this is not a drawing that's perfectly patterned, but they're perfectly evenly distributed around the three-dimensional surface of the egg, around the yolk. Does that make sense? At that point, that's called the blastoderm. So blastoderm formation is the formation of this uniform three-dimensional single layer, single layer, that's key, of cells that surround the yolk. That's the blastoderm. 
And that's a point, that's a key point in development that organisms reach, okay? So there's a point in Drosophila where, in Drosophila, the blasted formation is kind of unique because they're all syncytia, and then at the point where blastoderm forms, they cellularize. <clears throat> that means they actually then become distinct cells with distinct membranes. So cellularization happens at blastoderm formation in Drosophila. Okay, then gastrulation. And then gastrulation, okay, that's that key process of that's when you have, you originally have the blastoderm, which is one layer, and you take that layer and you fold it in on itself, just like a piece of paper. You take a piece of paper and you fold it in on itself. Now there's two layers. Does that make sense? That's gastrulation. And gastrulation allows you to define different layers of cells like ectoderm, ectoderm, mesoderm, endoderm. And these are the different layers from foldings of the blastoderm in on itself. And then different morphog morphogens affect different layered tissues. So internal organs, internal organs are gonna develop from the endoderm cells. That's where you're gonna get the kidneys. It's where you're gonna get mosquito, or insects don't have kidneys, but they have um, malpigian tubules. That's how you're gonna get the malpigian tubules. That's how you're gonna get the gut. That's how you're gonna get the stuff. Certain tissues are gonna form from brain cells uh, from certain things. Ectoderm is gonna form the skin. And insects is gonna form the cuticle, the exoskeleton. It's gonna form the musculature might be partly mesoderm or endoderm. But basically like it's gonna be slightly different for frogs versus humans versus like, but the essential premise is the same that you fold in on yourself through gastrulation, you get these different layers of cells and then these different layers of cells start to form the organs and the structures. And that's all based on different morphogenic patterns, okay? So this is all kind of a quick summary of early development. Um, and I'll just, I'll just quick say that this is only a very, very tiny part of development, right? Like when you develop an, a heart, you have to, that's a, that's a, that's a complex organ to develop. So there's also lots of morphogens down the line. Like you could spend your whole life just literally studying how do you develop a certain blood cell in a heart, right? Like there, it gets more complicated, but this is in general, the basic idea of how these things develop and how it relates to insect transgenesis, like we were talking about yesterday. So let's say you have two eggs. Let's say you insect one, in, inject one that's at blastoderm, and it's been cellularized, cellularized. So you got all these separate cells. Or you inject very, very early before, before blastoderm. So this is when it's a syncytia. I'm not gonna spell it right, but whatever, syncytia. Which one of these is most likely to be worked to get into the germline? In the syncytia or the cellularized blastoderm? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the syncytia, because it's all shared cytoplasm and whatever you injected here could diffuse wherever it needs to go. If you inject here, whatever you inject in is compartmentalized in the cell. And that's how you produce a chimeric or a mosaic. But if you don't want your gene to be that's a really good question. So do I have enough time to answer this? I have one minute. I'll do my best. So in fruit flies, we have very, very, very advanced systems because if you know there are promoters, there are promoters that only turn on in eyes. Okay. So imagine coupling gene X with an eye promoter. You can put that in the germline but it won't turn on unless it's in the eye. Does that make sense? So that's all based on regulation, which is why I spent so much time teaching you guys about promoters. So if you want to change catfish eye, you find a catfish eye promoter. You couple that with your gene, transgenic insert that gene with that promoter, and then you change the eye color. Does that make sense? It's all promoters, all genetic regulation. That's why we spent the whole first part talking about that. All right, good talk. I like this topic.